The astronomers are assembled in a large hall embellished with instruments. The president and members of the committee enter. Everybody takes his seat. Entrance of six man servants carrying the telescopes of the astronomers. The president takes his chair and explains to the members his plan of a trip to the moon. His scheme is approved by many, but one member violently opposes Sam. After some argument, the president throws his papers and books at his head. Upon order being restored, the trip proposed by the president is voted by acclamation. Five learned men make up their minds to go with them. The man servants bring traveling suits. President Barbonfouille selects five colleagues to accompany him. Nostradamus, Alcofribas, Omega, Micromegas, and Parafaragaramus. They enter the interior of a workshop where smiths, mechanics, weighers, carpenters, upholsterers, etc. are working hard at the completion of the machine. Chromegas accidentally falls into a tub of nitric acid. A workman informs the astronomers that if they would ascend to the roof, they would witness a splendid spectacle, the casting of the gun. The astronomers hasten to a ladder and climb on the roof where they finally arrive. Against the horizon, the chimneys are seen belching forth volumes of smoke. Suddenly, a flag is hoisted. At the signal, a mass of molten steel is directed from each furnace into the mold for the gun. The mold pours forth flames and vapor. This causes much rejoicing among the enthusiastic astronomers. On the top of the roofs of the town, pompous preparations have been made. The shell is in position ready to receive the travelers. These arrive. Respond to the acclamations of the crowd. And enter the shell.
A marine closes the bridge through which they have passed. A number of gunners are now pushing the shell up and inclined into the mouth of the gun. The cannon is loaded. The bridge is closed. Everyone is anxiously waiting for the signal which starts the shell on its voyage. The officer gives the signal. The gun is fired and the shell disappears into space. The shell coming closer every minute, the mood magnifies rapidly until finally it attains colossal dimensions. Suddenly, the shell pierces the eye of the moon. The shell comes down with a crash. The astronomers get out and are delighted at the landscape which is new to them. Against the horizon, the Earth is rising slowly into space, illuminating the picture with a fantastic light. The astronomers inspecting the strange country see craters everywhere. Just as they are about to explore, an explosion throws the unfortunate men violently in all directions. The astronomers show signs of fatigue after the rough trip they have just had. They stretch themselves out on the ground and go to sleep. Seven gigantic stars representing the great bear appear slowly. And out of the stars come faces of women who seem annoyed at the presence of these intruders in the moon. In their dreams, they see passing in space comets, meteors, etc. Then, the stars are replaced by a lovely vision of Phoebus on the crescent, of Saturn in his globe surrounded by a ring, and of charming young girls holding up a star. They decide to punish the terrestrial in an exemplary manner. By order of Phoebus, snow is falling from all quarters, covering the ground with his white coat. The cold becomes terrible. The unfortunate voyagers wake up half frozen. They decide, without hesitation, and in spite of the danger, to descend into the interior of a great crater, in which they disappear one by one whilst the snowstorm is still raging. The astronomers arrive in the interior of a most curious grotto, filled with enormous mushrooms of every kind. One of them opens his umbrella to compare its size with a mushroom. But the umbrella suddenly takes root and transforming itself into a mushroom starts growing gradually, attaining gigantic proportions. The astronomers suddenly notice strange beings coming out from underneath the mushrooms while making singular contortions. These are the Selenites, or inhabitants of the moon. A fantastical being rushes on an astronomer who defends himself and with a stroke of his umbrella, the selenite burst into a thousand pieces. A second suffers the same fate. But the selenites are arriving in numbers. The terrified astronomers, to serve themselves, take flight with the selenites in pursuit. Succumbing to numbers, the astronomers are captured, bound and taken to the palace of the king of the selenites. On a splendid throne, surrounded by living stars, the Selenite king is seated. President Barbonfouy makes a dash for the king of the Selenites and, lifting him like a feather, 
throws him violently on the ground. The unfortunate king bursts like a bombshell. The astronomers run away in the midst of the general disorder. The Selenite army is pursuing them. The astronomers run at full speed, turning around each time they are pressed too closely, and reducing the fragile beings to dust. The still increasing number of Selenite obliges the astronomers to take desperately to flight again. At last, the astronomers have found their shell and quickly shed themselves in the interior. Thanks to the advance, they have succeeded in getting over their adversaries. Only one, the president, has been left behind. He rushes to the rope which hangs from the point of the shell, and letting himself slide down the rope, he gives it an impetus which causes the shell to fall off the edge of the moon. A selenite clinging to the shell to hold it back is drawn with it, and hanging on the projectile accompanies it in its drop. The shell falls with sickening rapidity. The sea appears. We continue following the course of the shell into the bottom of the ocean. The shell balances, and, thanks to the hermetically sealed air in its interior, rises slowly to the surface, to the puzzlement of the fishes. The shell is picked up by a steamer, which tows it to port, where a general ovation awaits the happy return. <laughs>